Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. It might be evening, might be morning, might be afternoon, however it is. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the day so far. Okay, so without any further ado, let's just jump right into what we're going to be talking about. Um, okay, the uh, presentation is pretty much going to follow this, uh, this order. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit of description of the product itself. Uh, then move into some of the applications for it. Um, we're going to talk about uh, some data collection, actually how to collect data, some of the do's and don'ts. And then Daryl's going to spend some time running through the Castaway software with everyone. Um, the picture you see below here, that's actually, if you happen to know him, that's Darren Hansen from our UK office that's uh, somewhere off the English coast. Uh, he's doing a Castaway with the Castaway. Talk a little bit about the design criteria, the background, certain things were, were chosen. Um, it, it was really uh, uh, an idea of taking a fresh and independent approach to designing a CTD. You know, if you look at a lot of the CTDs out on the market today, um, they are, you know, long, narrow, they sometimes very large or have cages around them and have various uh, sensors protruding from them. And really the, the, the fresh idea was just, a, let's, let's start with designing something that, that looks like it needs to be dropped in the water. It looks like it could be dropped in the water. So the castaway started with a hydrodynamic shape um, that had a um, terminal velocity that would keep it falling at about one meter a second uh, without any weight added to it. The other constraint we put on it was uh, just kind of focusing on the shallow water, you know, less, less than 100 meter deep. I think there, there's some estimates out there that anywhere between 50 and 75 percent of all um, CTD casts, be it for sound velocity, whatever, are actually made in those depths, and there's not really a specific device for that. Um, the emphasis was really on usability and efficient data collection, you know, eliminating the need for cables uh, or connectors uh, or, or, or other, you know, devices to have to use it and try to make it as all-inclusive as possible. Uh, by incorporating some, you know, practical technologies such as GPS and uh, Bluetooth and such, and also to make sure that it was uh, sampling at five hertz to to ensure that we were getting proper proper data. Um, the just sort of sort of a uh, couple of the main features that, uh, about the device is that again, there's no cables connectors. The user operates with a ma with a magnetic stylus. Uh, just touching these contact points that I'm showing here will control the device. Uh, we can see here just an example of where the uh, GPS position is shown on the screen at start. So the user gets instantaneous feedback about where the device, uh, where the device is. The GPS is actually one of the really uh, innovative features of the Castaway that really enhances its usability. Um, going to a description of the device, uh, just kind of looking at a, a, a plan view, a profile view, um, you can see that, uh, again, here are the, the, the three magnetic call effect buttons that uh, um, control the device. Again, LCD screen, it's built fully pressurized with the 100 meter operator operational limit. And uh, there's this jacket that it fits into. This uh, is a uh, sort of a plastic jacket that the actual device will slide into. And you can see the attachment points at the top for a line for casting. And at the bottom for additional weight, it's whatever we can make for additional weight. See, there's a small way of how, how deep it's going. And these blue lines are showing uh, the, the flow. This is the flow through sensor. So the cell is actually inside there. Again, there's nothing protruding for, for things to get caught on. It, it is a flow through the Yeah, I would just add, Chris, they, you know, the, it's a little hard for the description-wise, but it is a magnetic button, but there's really no physical um, activity. The button isn't actually pushing in. You just, you know, get near it with the magnetic stylus. Uh, it is a recessed station itself so that you don't accidentally trip one of those buttons. But, you know, we call them buttons, but it's not a physical button or that you would see that you would push. You just need to get the magnetic stylus nearby. So. Thank you. 
shows the castaway and how it goes into the sleeve and where it's uh, easy to use as possible and try to incorporate modern technologies and kind of take the use to say a few things about what some of the trials you went through in, in designing it. Yeah, it, went, it, uh, it was a couple number of things that we tried to do. We, we originally started with a mechanical arrangement to, to try to hold the castaway to allow an attachment and it didn't require any tools for switching out batteries or pulling out the um, material. It, it seems to work really well. Uh, we've been using it for a number of months now in the field and uh, it's been great. So we also um, talk about the uh, no tools required, and that was really to access the bottom half of the, the unit itself. And you can see it's with a bayonet seal, uh, two AA batteries. This is pictorial, is you know Duracell AA batteries. But we've actually seen better performance from the Duracell rechargeables with the Castaway. So it's a very reasonable thing to do to run the run the system on a rechargeable AA battery, um, and as we even get better performance from them. As it says there, 40 hours continuous operation. And one other thing I'll point out while we're on the screen is there's a small black dot there on the right-hand side, and that's actually a spare stylus. Um, you know, we've all been in the field, drop a spare stylus, drop your stylus over the over the water or whatever to operate the, the system. So here is a spare one. It's annoyingly small, so you won't use it as your default, but it is uh, it is there for you in case you need it. You're not completely cooked with here if you're in the field and you drop it. So. Not just to read that, most of the time you, you'll have the castaway actually in the sleeve itself. Um, it, it is a little bit, uh, uh, takes a little bit of effort to, to unlock the vein seal. It is a tight seal, but uh, you know we tested it with enough folks that, that most anybody can do it with a little bit of uh, you know muscle pressure to open and close it. Um, this is a uh, next slide shows a side view or sort of a end view of showing the, the flow through cell, the measurement cell. And there is a, um, a six electrode conductivities, uh, six electrodes for the conductivity sensing, and a single electrode for the temperature. And they're they're fairly well protected inside there because it's all encased. Um, can it be damaged? Well, really only if you stick something hard up there and bend them. And, and it's obviously something you don't want to do. Um, however, you know we do. They, they can get dirty. There is a way to clean them. We're going to talk about uh, a little later. Be as easy as use as possible and not have any sort of uh, any sort of damage. Um, one thing I want to note is that the, the thermistor has a very fast response rate, uh, 200 mils, better than 200 milliseconds. Um, so it's right there with you know, the, the rest of the competitive field in terms of being a, a state of the art CTD. For for cleaning the sensor, um, it is a it's a flow through. Uh, design and uh, you simply if you go to the right of the screen here where I'm showing the, the cleaning aspect of it there's a bottle brush included with the, the kit and you can actually slide it up there if you happen to get uh, oil on it or uh, some other sort of uh, contamination to the sensors you can gently rub that bottle brush back and forth inside there you use a little bit of soap and water too exactly a little bit of soap and water around the Gulf Coast with going through oil, the system will actually continue to function once it's, once it's cleaned. But if it does go through oil and those sensors get coated, it can interfere with your time to measurement. All you really need to do is when you recover it, even out in the field, you just uh, run that bottle brush up and down, clean those sensors back off again. And uh, we even, as we mentioned here on the second one down, uh, second bullet there, we do have some self-diagnostics where the system will detect it if the electrodes are actually coded in an inconsistent way that could affect your measurement and warn the user that they might consider uh, uh, cleaning it. Yeah, just, just jumping again here to some of the self-diagnostics because we get that question a lot, you know, how do I know my instrument's doing well or in, in, in measuring properly? And that's a big part of uh, the CTD and the reason for having a castaway and even having an LCD screen on it so you can get instant feedback to see if it's operating properly. Uh, something that's good to have. Um, Daryl talked about the six electro design. Um, there's also an internal thermistor for uh, compensating for any housing temperature effects. 
And this is fairly important is if you're trying to measure precise temperatures, you, you want to be sure that you're you have and much sure that that we're that we've taken care of that and that's being compensated for um, in the device. Um, there's there's also the diagnostic check for that. Um, that's the, if something does happen, uh, that that can be part of the data set and you're you're warned about it. Um, you also the, the fall rate measurements uh, remove the no flow conditions. That's you know, basically based on a pressure change as the instrument's falling. So um, all that's been taken care of in the, the firmware of the device and, and the operation of the device. The field kit that it comes in, and that slide's coming right up, there it is. Uh, you know, pretty much in following general YSI philosophy is trying to give you everything that you need to use in one, you know, one kit. So we try to think of just about everything you would need to have, you know, spares and whatever. So of course you have the castaway and a jacket in there. Uh, we've given you a line uh, with a carabiner on it for flipping to the top. And, and it, how long is the line again, Darrell? Uh, 50 feet. 50 feet, so roughly 15, 20 meters, or maybe it's 17 and a half meters or something like that. Not enough to do a full cast, but enough to do a shallow water cast. Uh, there's a quick guide in there. Um, might have, there's also a user manual uh, in, include, included on the, uh, the USB uh, piece that's in there, but there's a quick dark skill that you need to get it going. You probably really don't need the software and how that operates or you want to learn a little more about CTD casting in general. But, you know, for, for the, you know, the average uh, user, everything you need is on a quick start guide. Um, Units only takes uh, two AA batteries inside it, but there's a room to store four. And I believe it comes with four in the kit. It does, yeah. So you can, when they're not inside it when you actually get it, but you open it up, put the two batteries in, you have a couple spares there right away. And you see down here there's a couple of, uh, there's two styluses, and there's also a stylus, as we showed you early, inside the pool. From us, um, it's on the, on the standard price list for the product. I'd also take the time, since it's here, to mention two things. One, uh, we did decide, since we took this picture, that we're going to go ahead and offer the uh, two, or we're, we're sending each unit out with two carabiners, slightly better carabiner, or stainless steel locking. Uh, we don't want anybody to, to lose their system, certainly. Uh, so we went ahead and did that. The second thing is you'll see some variances in the variability in the, t the color of the jacket. So the fact orange uh, from you know, the black and orange looks pretty nice and it's pretty catchy, uh, but the orange is really more, more of a practical color in the field for two reasons. One is visibility, and two, from a heating standpoint. We really don't want the internal temperature of the body of the, of the CTD to be any warmer than it needs to be. We understand these are going to be on the deck of boats, left out in the sun, and we want to minimize the temperature influence that that has. So just to kind of clarify, because some people uh, have questioned that. Okay. Um, you just move to the next slide here is a specification page now you know, it's been up on the screen for a while so I'm not going to read through the specifications you can refer to those on your own if you want I will reiterate we get some questions about the uh, sampling rate recorder capacity again it is a five hertz sampling rate you want to keep that in mind as, as you figure out how what your what your cast rate is like I said typical fall rate is about a meter per second if you don't use a weight with it um, the recorder capacity is uh, it's 15 mega Approximately enough for 750 k. If you're, if you're using a, maybe a one one meter per second cast for you know 40 hours of operation, how many of those can you do? And that that number, that 750 number, is probably really somewhere between 500 and 1,000, depending upon how you do it. Mm -hmm. But really, it, it fits well with the battery life. So you got 40 hours of battery life. You have more than enough time to to, to fill that recorder up. Um, so they, they balance each other pretty well. And, yeah, I think, Daryl, you said uh, you could do it about two weeks. Yeah, a couple weeks I later. think two to four weeks, depending on the usage, and without necessarily needing to either format the recorder or, you know, replacing the batteries. You know, it should really be, you know, a month's worth of typical usage. Right. The other thing is uh, the Bluetooth communication. We get some questions of what's the range. You know, we, we put a nominal range of 10 meters on it. It all depends on it may not be quite it may not be quite as long as that, but in an open room or, or outdoors where there's nothing interfering, it, you know, you may get 20 or 30 meters out of it. So nominal, we say about uh, about 10 meters out of the Bluetooth, and it seems to work pretty robustly. 
Um, the other question we get to, again, this is a conductivity, temperature, and depth instrument, so it's directly measuring pressure, uh, temperature, and conductivity, as you see over here on the left-hand side. And uh, all the other uh, outputs are derived by calculations, which is you know, pretty standard in the industry. Um, we get a lot of questions about the sound speed uh, algorithm we're using. It's a Chen Valero uh, formula. There, there are some other ones out there, but this is the one that, that we chose to use as the most commonly accepted one. Of course, salinity is a uh, derived um, parameter off of the conductivity measurement, uh, as well as depth is a, you know depth is a derived measurement based upon pressure. That, you know, we record that raw data. We are these are the derived parameters that that we are outputting through the software, but the user can clearly output that data in a raw form, and if they have their own method of calculating it, they can do their own calculations too. If they prefer, as you mentioned, the sound speed, there's, yeah. there's a number of other of, uh, number of equations out there a person would, re would prefer, they can, they can certainly run it off the raw data. Okay, now just uh, kind of running through some of the applications for the device. You know, we, when, in, in the early going year since we've developed the device, we kind of had three in mind. Uh, they kind of fit with uh, the you know, wide size uh, uh, customer base and, and, and goals and such. Um, one, of course, is hydrographic surveying. This is you know measuring depths and such, and, and using sound velocity for corrections. Uh, the second would be oceanography, you know, for for a lot of different uh, factors. And the third one being inland, inland water hydrology, which is maybe a little bit more of a traditional YSI market. Um, but that being said, one um, is basically. Uh, Looking at the stratifications of salinity and, temp and temperature, you know, it could be an estuary, it could be a river, it could be the ocean, it could be anywhere. This, this device is fully designed to work in any um, yeah. aquatic environment, any natural environment uh, that this is a saltwater or freshwater. Yeah, it's interesting because we've had some feedback from early uh, our beta testers and users that have been out there for the last few months, and the, one of the responses is that because it's so easy and so simple to use. They actually are collecting more data. They're collecting more casts, and um, it's giving them more coverage and uh, better because of the simplicity and, and how easy small it is to do. Right, collected in Miami. You know, meter cast here, and you can see the the quick change in salinity that the uh, unit was able to pick up. Yeah. Uh, Application, um, you know, again, we're, we're measuring the same basic parameters: uh, conductivity and temperature. We're and the slide that pop up here is a little bit of a delay. I understand it, but um, um, you know, the, 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 there's a commonly accepted formula, which is the Chen Valero formula, which takes uh, takes the, the, the takes the conductivity and the temperature and computes the sound speed profile. So that correctors can be applied to um, measurements made by multi-beam or single-beam echo sounder, so you can actually get a correct, corrected depth. Um, lastly, there's uh, applications in uh, inland ecology, we're calling it. This is uh, maybe some of the more traditional YSI customer base or some, you know, some of our Sontech users out there. You see a user here with one of the Sontech River Surveyor products. Um, you know, there's actually a requirement from the United States Geological Survey that uh, every time you make a measurement with an ADCT that you get a, a check of the temperature um, uh, to yep. be part of that data. That's just one of the applications. We're seeing a lot of people wanting to use them in lakes and reservoirs, um, for various surveys or for, um, you know, there's the Yeah, it's one of the reasons why we just recently added the point after, uh, from some feedback from those beta customers, the same ones I was just referring to. It, some of them didn't want to always do a cast, and so we actually implemented a, a point measurement, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Right. Okay, so we uh, collecting data with the castaway, and you know, maybe to start off with just this review of if, if any of the folks out there have actually done this. Um, you know, typical CTD cast done with uh, um, you know deep water conductivity temperature depth measurement. You can see, you know, this, this is the this is a common configuration of one. It's got a it's got a cage. It's got a a pump in it, you know, it, it pumps the water through the cell. So, in order to use a device like this, you first got to hook it up to the computer, you know, get get it initialized, make sure it's got all the settings in it you want. You got to turn it on, which could involve getting the pump operating or you know whatever other features it has that needs power. 
Um, if you have a large unit with a low cage, you're going to need a large winch or crane, which means you're going to need a large boat to use to get it over the side. Um, or if, if you want to assign a geographic position to it, um, you've got to go to whatever positioning instrumentation you have available. It could be a handheld GPS, could be survey, write it down and, and somehow attach it to the data record, whether electronically or manually. Um, then once you pull it up, you got to turn turn your pumps off and maybe you know hook up the instrument, turn it off again, and then physically download your data over a cable so you can receive the data you got is good. And you know with the castaway, you know we're trying to take a fresh approach to that and make it a one two three test or one two three process. So really with the castaway, it's pretty easy. I mean you again you basically take the unit out of the box. You know, you get, once you get the batteries in it, uh, I do want to emphasize you do have to connect a, a, a line to it. We'll <laughs> yeah. say that several times more through here that uh, we actually have some people who just want to chuck it in the water. And it will sink and it will, you will lose it if you do that. Yeah. Uh, recovery system. In it. So if it, if it goes in there without being tied on, it's not coming back. Yeah, you got to go swimming to get it. So you better hope the water is pretty shallow. <laughs> and warm. <laughs> um, but, you know, you secure the line to it, um, you know, tie a proper knot, uh, use a carabiner. Um, and you can get from step one to step two basically in a matter of uh, half a minute, maybe. Yeah, if that. maybe less. Yeah. And then drop it in the water. And really the process dropping in the water, you may want to hold it there at the surface for... Uh, we say five to ten seconds just to let things equilibrate. Really... Right. Not anything more than that is necessary. Uh, I know some other systems that are out there, traditionally they're left in there for two minutes or three minutes to let things get all settled and pumps to pump. Um, with this system, um, and especially with some of the techniques, it's not necessary to do anything more than five or ten seconds. Yeah, so just a quick pause. And, and you know, in this particular photo, there's no weight attached to the bottom of it. So you know, just let it free fall, and it will fall at about you know, a meter a second. And you know, it, once it's fall to the desired depth, um, you pull it back up. Uh, you take your second GPS fix by you know tapping it with magnetic stylus, and then you can review the data instantly. To make an adjustment, do another cast, go to a different area. It saves you a lot of time and having to hook it up to a machine and, and review the data to tell tell whether you've got something uh, that's good or not. Yeah, one of the things maybe it's a good point, time to point out. Standard to drop at a meter per second. That's where that five hertz comes from. You have five points for at a meter per second. We get five points to define that meter. So people ask, well, well, can I drop it faster than that? And the answer is yes. You can drop it as fast as you can physically drop it, but you know you're going to reduce the number of points in that covered area. So if you're doing you know two meters a second, so it's going to be five points over two meters instead uh -huh. of five points over one meter. So it really does. It, taking data at five hertz, and then um, it just depends on your drop rate. Same is true if you go slower. So. Okay, uh, and this is the first portion where we have a, um, a screen here. You just switch that one, right? No. That's the E. Yep. And then over here. Oh, you need to switch to that. We're going to go to an interactive. Uh, so an interactive guide here, and this is basically a simulation of what you would see if you were actually doing the uh, the work on the on the face of the castaway. So it's a way for us to simulate for you folks in the, out there that don't have one in front of you, and it's going to behave identically to to what you might do if you were out there. So there's three buttons, and I can actually push on those with the mouse, and I can make the system do what it would do if you physically had one in your hand. So to start out with, um, that was the boot screen, and we'll um, go from red totally to green, and then the three, um, the three little. So, you know, after battery a cold start, we might have a, a few minutes of warm up time for the GPS, but after that, the GPS will acquire a signal within uh, two seconds, so it's very quick. So we have uh, the power button here on the upper left-hand corner. So the corners rep uh, over top of each one or just below here in the case of the upper left. 
represent what you're going to be doing. The upper right typically shows you where you are. So this is the home screen. It's showing your battery voltage, your, your file uh, storage space, Bluetooth indicator, GPS indicator. Um, this is the power button up in the left-hand side. I can turn the system off. On left with this arrow, I can select what I want to do. So for the first one, uh, it defaults to the cast, and that's the little picture of the PCD with the, to the uh, line attached to the top. And when I'm ready to implement that, I the execute button, which is the green, the circular green button here on the bottom right. I just want to point out here, the time in the system is all U always UTC. So we get that from the GPS, we store our files with the UTC, and that's, uh, that's always for reference. So don't get confused if you're seeing that time, it's not going to be your local time. Now the software does convert that to, to your local time based on your computer settings. So if you do want to refer to it um, in local settings, you can do it through the software. So here I'm going to pick CAF. I'm going to implement that, and we can go to the, what's called what is the GPS acquisition screen. Again, you can see a, the date and time up in the upper left-hand corner. We don't have to get a GPS. We require you to have the time and date, and that's so that we can properly stamp the files. But we, um, most of the time, GPS is certainly what we want to uh, encourage people to do because that gets stored with the data file for its life and, and can't be changed. If you collect data, though, in a, in a cave or in an area that you can't get a GPS, high coverage or high, uh, can't, you might not be able to get a good GPS signal, um, you can bypass the GPS by hitting this button when it's red or yellow or green. Obviously, the longer you wait, the better the signal, the, the better the actual uh, location information. So you may have caught it up front. It started out as red. It flashed yellow and flashed green. It flashes in two ways, both on the screen and also this LED here, um, the multicolor LED that gives you some feedback, nice and bright lights that um, sometimes difficult to see what's going on, and you don't have to be looking at the screen. So then once I get the GPS, I, I click that execute button, and you may have caught where it said that the screen will dim out in five seconds, and basically after five seconds we shut the screen off, but you'll see that the button is still blink, or the LED is still blinking green. And that's giving you an indication that the system is uh, behind the scenes collecting data. You, again, put it in the water at this point, let it drop to, you know, bring it back to the surface, uh, hit any button, and it will immediately go back into the GPS acquisition screen. Same goes here. If you don't feel like waiting for a GPS on the, set, on the, on the return cast, you don't have to. You can bypass it, of course. It only takes two or three seconds, so we find that we typically try to do that. It gives us some information on how much we've moved from the, the cast, the down cast, and the up cast. It's, a, you know, you're, it's very difficult to measure exactly the same water twice. So when you're looking at this data and you're looking at up and down cast, and you're looking for why, it, why things may be slightly different, it's great to have that indication on where, how, well, how much you may have moved between those two points. Um, and once I get that GPS lock with the green next, and again the green LED, I can go ahead and hit end and end cast. And as soon as that I do that, it takes me to a data review screen. And from here, I can see the time, the latitude and longitude at which the the station of that sample of the of the cast itself, the number of samples that were taken during that cast. Um, we can do that here. And we have a first this is shown in degree C, and you'll see a plot. Okay, you're not going to make any world environmental decisions based on this plot, but you can evaluate your data and see if you've collected some, uh, something that might be of interest. Maybe some parameter or something has changed in a way that you didn't anticipate. Maybe it didn't go down as far as you had thought it would have, and you can ask these questions right there. Uh, without getting a computer, not booting a computer, um, and you don't have to carry a cell phone in the field or whatever else. We've all been there. It rains in the field. It, all bad things happen in the field, so we understand that. We want to make it easy for you. So uh, we get temperature. We do other things. In the software, you can actually control how many of these screens get shown. So if you're in the profile, the secondary screen, the next screen is connectivity. Uh, the font next screen is salinity. 
and the last screen is um, town speed. And once I finish that, it'll come. It'll go right back around to the beginning of that uh, data file review. If I'm done reviewing, I can hit the home button, or I can actually hit the down and up buttons here by and compare other casts, previous casts or next cast or the previous casts by going up and down using the up and down arrow keys. So we're back home. Once we're back to the start screen, we can go home and see back in home. The home, the main home screen. At the main home screen, the file folder there shows that's where the, we can go back and we can review data. You can also see we've changed some of the icons here so we can get is getting a little low. Um, again, going into that file folder will allow us to review the data. The next one is I, I hinted at with, when Chris was talk, when Chris was speaking a few minutes ago about the point measurement. It's a, something that we at it most recently and allows the customer to collect a point um, fairly quickly. And we'll go over the details about how to do that here in a minute. But you know, essentially, concept is the same. We get a GPS point. We only get one GPS point on, in in the case of a point measurement rather than two. The expectation is it's just for a point, so we don't really need an up and down look. If I don't, if I want to abort the mission from here or abort the or abort the sample from here, I can just hit this button up here on the left hand side, and it will return me back to the home screen. No harm done. And we maybe we were going to do a point measurement, but decided to do a cast, and we can just cast it. The big I on the right hand side is uh, for information, and that's um, really uh, the phone numbers. If you have any? the firmware version of the system. The system can be upgraded um, through the software, through its Bluetooth. There's no, no cables required, again. Um, but also in here, we have this little in the health indicator. We can go in there, and we can look at uh, some, some data from the sensors without recording and without shutting off the power from the screen. So if you wanted to look at your conductivity, temperature, pressure, just to see how they were, what they were looking like in the raw form. Again, we come back to the main menu, and really, that's the interactive, the interactive guide. Okay, thanks, Daryl. Okay. And Chris will take it back over for a little bit. Okay. Uh, the next slide, we're going to talk a little about, uh, <clears throat> you know, some some sort of do's and don'ts about uh, practice using the castaway. First, I'd like to point out in this photo is that uh, you know, I was just at the Canadian Hydrographic Conference uh, uh, yesterday, actually, up in Canada, and uh, they saw the picture of the fishing pole, and they're like, great, this is my excuse to go out and, and take a fishing pole out of my survey launch. So, hey, you know, whatever, whatever well, suits you. Well, I can say from the, develop, from the development side, it's been a blast to be able to put uh, those fishing poles onto a expense report. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that's a great thing. So. But that is that is a that is a way to can handle it. I mean, the castaway itself weighs about a pound. Uh, I'd be sure that uh, you're really conservative about you know using uh, the right kind of uh, line. You know, yeah. really, really heavy. Uh, yeah, we use 80 pound line for the reels that we use, and we have used both the standard monofilament, but also we recently have switched over to a wire, which is actually a filament wire that uh, allows for better abrasion control, especially if you're working around bricks. You know, but the spider wire is a little bit more tolerant. Um, it does tangle a little easier, so you have to be careful of that. But certainly very reasonable to do, just uh, you know, err on the conservative side. So, right. so again, as we talked about, if you're, however you however you you know, whatever rate you whatever rate you decide to drop it at, try to keep it steady. You know, try to keep keep it consistent. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when you got the extra weight attached and and having a fishing reel helps when you have extra weight attached because that rig will change and you're able to control a little bit better that in that fashion. Um, try to keep the speed of the drop uh, and raise to the equal to the vertical spatial resolution. You know, this won't impact the accuracy; it just impacts the amount of data you collect per you know per per unit of vertical drop. Um, one other thing too is that the GPS antenna exists you know kind of behind the screen. So what you want to do is you want to keep and just like you would with any other GPS unit, 
you know, you see a survey launch with its antenna, you want it as high as possible, you'll get a, you'll get a slightly better fix if you do that. Yeah, and keep it open to as much of a surround as you possibly can. You know, if your body's blocking it and so on. Especially, it will vary from during the day, uh, up and down, depending on where you are in the world and what time you're, you're trying to acquire. Yeah, and like in a GPS too, your your accuracy is going to depend upon its uh, the satellite configuration and everything as well. So. Um, that in mind, there will be some variability there. The other thing I was going to mention while we're here is the um, we've been using dive reels also quite quite well have worked out quite well. So the dive, traditional dive reels that divers use for cave diving and things attached to a dive reel lines tend to be a little bit stronger. Um, hey, the thing, just just don't toss it in the water, especially don't toss it in the water again without a line attached. <laughs> It won't float. It will sink. Um, don't. And you can't leave it resting in the water either. It, like it reiterates, the flow through design. It has to move through the water or have water moving through it in order for it to take measurements. It, it can't just sit there. Otherwise, you're not going to get good. Uh, certainly, it can take some uh, some you know some amount of sunlight and heat and cycling back and forth. But again, it is it is an instrument. You know, you don't want to take it out in the parking lot and and play football with it. it it's, it's, uh, you know, you want to handle it with care. I mean, obviously, a lot of uh, done drop tests and other things with it to make sure it's as robust as possible. But you know, it, it is possible to be broken with mishandling. Yeah, you know, we we iterate so much a number of times here to make sure we we both tie it on, but also to make sure we keep it moving. Now, it is a flow through cell. It's impractical to keep it moving all the time, and the software looks for those things when the when the when the system is not moving up or down, or there's no flow through the cell, and and then will not use that data uh, for that for that particular cast in that section. So, so it, it although we tell people not to do it, we suggest they don't do it. We know that in the field it's impractical not to have some of those, and it's okay. It just shouldn't be the primary. Okay, so. Um, uh, some of the operational limits, uh, again, it's designed specifically for 100 meters depth. Um, the pressure sensor is only rated to 100 meters depth, so below which you could get permanent damage. So, yeah, take some care to make sure that your line is not more than 100 meters long when you, when you send it down so that you know you're not exceeding it. Uh, because it's not, it's not designed to go much lower than that. Uh, can't overemphasize that. Yeah, and the big thing is, is that it's gonna, it could potentially affect your calibration on the pressure sensor. That's where, that's the big impact. You know, we can guarantee that that zero to 100 meters, we stay within that, and we can we can warranty those specs. But beyond, if you go beyond that, we can do some some permanent damage or change that diaphragm, and that will change your calibration. Again, the other thing is, is uh, the, the device only works in water. Um, you know, other liquids, there's really no validity to what it's measuring. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. We've had that question already a couple times, and you know, it's, it's designed for for use in uh, you know fresh and salt water, you know, outdoor use. Um, <clears throat> some, you know, the, there are the derived parameters are just a function of the formulas used for uh, calculating them, but they're valid in temperatures minus 2 to 40 degrees C and salinity is up to 42. Um, the raw conductivity, temperature, and pressure data, you know, exceed the limits of, of the derived parameters, but, you know, that's, that's just a function of the formulas we use. We don't have a whole lot of control over that. Yeah, and, and you as users have access to that raw data if you, if you want to try to, to do your own calculations or if you're working in some research that, that work in those those extremes, the, the data is still there. It's just that the standard formulas uh, often fall apart. Right. Um, battery life is approximately 40 hours of continuous use. You know, factors that will affect that but as well, you know, how often you're Bluetoothing it or how many GPS fixes, you know. The actual casting itself is a pretty low power. I think uh, it's powered at all, but probably drives a little more is just getting more G GPS fixes and such. So the LCD, running the LCD. Running the LCD, LCD, yeah. So that, those, those sort of things sort of factor in there. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, also, again, the GPS signal to get a timestamp must be received if the system has been without power for, you know, more than 15 minutes. So that's just uh, one of those automatic features that we build into the system. Uh, again, just for um, reiteration sake, <laughs> Yeah, it's probably the third time. I think it's at least the third or fourth time. I don't know. Yeah. I'm laughing at us because clearly yeah. something people have to pay attention to. It doesn't float. It doesn't float. Green to pop up. Um, you know, going to pretty much follow the, the, the earlier, earlier slide we 
showed showing the one, two, three approach. But uh, this is actually comes from the quick start guide itself. I'm not going to run through everything in here. Daryl spent some time going through these screens already. But this is pretty much what's on the quick start guide. You know, I'll just go to the middle here, lower it in the water, let it free fall, pull it back up. That's really all you got to do. And, you know, a few taps of the stylus and you got the data. It's really pretty self-explanatory. I mean, I would venture to say you probably don't even really need a quick start guide. I would say. One of the things that we get often is people, when they first pick it up, touch the screen and not the button to try to push the button because we're all used to the cell phone interface and things. So this is an underwater instrument, so the screen can't be touch sensitive, otherwise you might have other issues. So we've had to put it in the magnetic button. Okay, so just going to the next slide. Um, as Daryl was talking about before, if you go to this little icon here, I'm sort of uh, function now for the castaway. There it goes. Where you can actually uh, um, it's called a point measurement, or sometimes some people call it a spot sampling, where it's not necessarily a profile data. It's actually collecting a, a single event. I guess for lack of better word, lack of better word describing it where you can put it in the water and either move it back and forth horizontally or vertically in a, in a, in a couple moves, just, just forward and back, and that way it, it flows water over the cell and you can get, you can get uh, just a single point data from that. And again, it's you know, pretty easy to do. Uh, the data comparison, just waiting for the slide to, to come up, there's a little slight delay here. Um, but we actually took the castaway out and uh, did a cast with an with a, um, alternative CTD, uh, one that's been uh, on the market quite a while offshore in San Diego. I'll let Daryl talk about the data set a little bit. Well, luckily, luckily you and I were sick that day, Chris, because when they went out, um, it was it, you know, throwing over a, well, tossing over a 40-pound beast uh, with a couple castaways attached to it and doing these comparison plots that you see here. Um, I think they came. The people that went out weren't very happy when they came back. Um, I tried to collect some money for from them. Just uh, the expectation, you know, most people have to pay for a workout center. We can we provide it for, as part of the job. Um, no, and, and uh, kidding aside, we went out and did this comparison. It was um, you can see the data. There's not a whole lot more to talk about. The red, uh, the blue line, and you can see that they're 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 right on top of each other. The castaway is the blue line. The other CTD is the red line and uh, both the up and the down cast match um, extremely well in both its response as well as um, the data itself. And this is a temperature change from about 17 degrees up there at the surface to just over 11 degrees down um, just below 100 meters. So uh, that's conductivity and temperature. Okay, we're gonna, now we're going to move to an interactive session on the uh, software, and uh, Daryl's going to run you through that. Uh, change here to the Castaway software. Let that come up. Um. Okay, so I think you're, you should be seeing the software. This is, uh, when you first install it, you'll see something similar to this. I do have, um, uh, the, the system ships with a standard map, which I've actually uh, gone to a Bing map. It provides a little bit more uh, information. And the first thing you're going to want to do is go to your Devices tab, and there's a Data tab and a Devices tab. So we'll go over to the Devices tab, and you can see that there I have one other device listed here. I'm going to, I have a device sitting here next to me, and I'm going to go ahead and turn that device on, and it is device number 28. So I'm going to add serial number 28 as my device, um, and it's going to, you'll see, this um, the system and automatically start to look to see if it's got all the files off of it. And it turns out that I actually haven't casted it since the last time uh, this, this, this particular computer has attached to it. Um, go, working from left to right, you can see it's device 29. Its current status is online. My battery is very low, as you can see. Um, the whole number of files on the unit is 29, new files zero. So um, it, if, it, if it detected that it had more and some new files, it would actually download those files and then uh, update that number there. 
and decrement it as it, as it downloaded them. So it only downloads the files that are new is what I'm trying to get out here. <laughs> okay, um, so that's actually part of the reason why my battery is showing. I can show you here we have a language where we can set the language of the unit itself and that's English metric, English imperial or uh, uh, Spanish is, uh, is an option so I can switch it to English metric and my battery type I have I had put in the Energizer Ultimate Lithium 1.5, which we've done some research on, which worked really, really well in cold conditions. Um, but if you wanted to use the recharge, you can change whether you're going to salinity, so conduct, speed of sound, you can check those, and also show the data during a cast. Now, why wouldn't you want to do that? Because if that takes a, a quite a bit of power to drive the LCD, so we turn it off as a default. But if you have an application where you'd like to see the data through the cast, you can certainly do that. Just note that the battery, um, the battery will be uh, more, better be, be more, uh, will go down much faster. Once I do that, I can go ahead and save the configuration, and it's going to communicate over Bluetooth. And you can see a little selection dialog. And as soon as it does that, um, you can see my batteries are still low uh, at just zero percent here. But um, that's that's essentially it right hand side I can also format the recorder and and I can upgrade firmware or reset to uh, factory defaults so that's uh, essentially how you would interact with the system you almost never need to go back into this this uh, screen here. It will automatically download the data and as that data is downloaded it will appear on your screen as another as another uh, dot uh, in the area. These blue dots that you see on the screen represent areas of casts and within those areas in this upper left hand one you see 204. That's 204 casts within that area. There's 14 in the bottom right here. And as I zoom in, the zoom works from scrolling the mouse wheel you'll see that one dot split or break up into multiple dots. And so now that 200 and whatever number it was drops into 149.52. Um, and again, we can zoom in even further than that. And it plots as many plots on the right-hand side as I have selected. Now you can see there's only maybe five or six. Even though I have 42 casts selected, there's only five or six. Um, being plotted. And that's based on the setting that we allow customers to reduce that number depending on their speed of the computer. Because if you're doing 100 meter casts, this can be quite a bit of data. So we, we let the user select that. But as we, we can say zoom selected, and if we zoom in here, um, you can see that this is a so instead of um, clicking on a dot, I can actually highlight a window around an, a section. So we can say zoom that area select. Each one of those will be a new. Each the updates taking a little bit of time here, but each of the the three. Maybe look at a geographic trend in terms of where the casts are. What That's the exactly. Temperature profile is now. That the time is another consideration that you can, you can call that out too. Exactly. So if you look at this, you go. Uh, we have a light blue, a purple, a uh, light blue, a purple, and a uh, green. So you can see trends that may be happening up and down. You need to take a look too at the scales that we're talking about. 9.6 degrees to 20.4 degrees. So the scales are pretty small. I can resize the windows. Um, so if I wanted to see more resolution, I don't need it to be as large as it is. So here we go. Um, let me shrink that back down again. The other thing I can also do uh, is actually change the number of plots that I'm showing. I'll select and change to three. And you can see we have temperature slant. Temperature and salinity. If I wanted to change the parameters so that maybe I have 
specific conductance here and salinity here or sound velocity here. We can just merely pull the pull the the, uh, the selection down and choose it. The other real uh, interesting feature of this of the software is to be able to drive to design or develop projects. So I have a number of projects here, and if I want to, I can add a profile or more than one profile to one or more projects. So more than one profile or a profile can live in more than one project, and one project can have more than one profile, and we can add and subtract as we need to. So if we want to go to Miami, I just moved over to Miami. Um, you're having a little bit of a delay in your screen. That um, in the Miami section, you will see a plot that shows um, that salinity that we had talked about just a few minutes ago uh, in the original presentation at CAST. Neat, uh, neat feature: the projects now can be. We can. I'll undo it so that we can. Well, we can go to. We can switch over and go to Lake Mead and uh, zoom to the, zoom to filter there, and you can see some data. As soon as the screen updates, we'll have data that was collected in Lake Mead. So it makes processing in your area. Now, of course, I'm jumping around the country, jumping around the world. Uh, you could be jumping around your city, the city or the state, depending on your application. We can also filter based on cast or point measurement. Uh, if you invalid or deleted. If you do have a, a value that you want to delete, you find a cast that's not really something you want, um, we can go ahead and, and delete that, that by right-clicking it and say mark as delete. It's going to delete that file, and but it's going to be retained in our database until you purge it. And we do that because we have to maintain all the files that are being downloaded and not downloaded and so on and so forth. Um, so what we can do is go up to settings and maintenance and we can uh, delete uh, purge data. We also allow you to back up your data here. You can import a language file and you can run the Castaway Translator. The Castaway Translator is a language translator, so it helps you translate the Castaway into your language of choice. And you can actually modify that, save it, and you can send that to your friends and you can then import it into their software. You can have your own language. Um, so it's pretty in English is their two default languages and we'll be adding more as we get uh, for one language. The other one I wanted to make sure we pointed out under the maps is the ability to add georeferenced images. So we can do georeferenced images in the settings. This section, which is still coming up on your screen, I will show you. We can change from a processed graph type to a raw type um, by the selection box here. The process is a, a culmination of up and down information. It's a. It takes a bunch of information. Takes the speed at which it's going through the water. Takes if it's going up and down. Uh, it looks at whether it's an upcast or downcast, and then picks the best possible data for each of those and provides one line out to the users. Again, if they'd rather see the up and down, they can select that or raw, and then, of course, they can export that out. Um, under georeferenced images, we can import georeferenced images. So if you have a georeferenced image of, of your area that you normally work in, you can import that, and then you can make it transparent or semi-transparent. You can have more than one image if you'd like. Um, so you know, it just depends on the speed of your computer and, and its performance. Uh, lots of other options in the software, but the one I for questions is an import and export. Um, we talked about uh, the, the filtering already in the in the projects, but importing well, it's importing is as easy as dragging and dropping a file onto onto the software. That file can come from someone else with a castaway, and that can be done through the export. And we allow you to export a single file use any of the current filters or are all files. So um, as an example, let me go back and select a few of these cats from, from Lake Mead here. And 
Um, we'll select those, and then I'll go to the export, and you can see that selected files automatically comes up. I can use the current filter. I can use the selected files. And then the formats that we have. We have Castaway Raw, Castaway with Edits, Castaway with Edits without with removing your project information. Perhaps you're working on a project you don't want anybody else to know about, um, but you still need to share the, share the data. So we allow you to move the data over to a colleague without your project information. CSV files, one that has just the flat separate, uh, comma separated, and one that has the CSV with the header information, giving you latitude and longitude and positional information. Um, it's a sort of non-traditional CSV, which is why we separated the two out. And then on the bottom, if you pick something like a CSV, you can pick the parameters that you want to have come out. So um, you can see here pressure, depth, temperature, conductivity, um, so on and so forth. And either in whole or in a zip file. And a zip file is a common zip file that you can then drag and drop on the software if you'd like to import it or share it with somebody else. So fairly easy to move data around, backup data, share it with uh, colleagues or between computers. Um, if you do try to import something that already exists, we don't overwrite it. It actually asks you if you want to overwrite the existing or if you want to take, uh, leave your old files in case you've modified them. And what data do you want to output? The cast of data, do you want to process down the up or the raw, down and up or raw. All of that is export um, capable. <clears throat> the last thing I want to add here is an export summary. Um, a neat, it's a, I, I kind of tend to this one right now because we just recently added it, uh, by, again, by a customer request. It, the export summary is a neat feature. It, this, again, I'm going to export selected files, and it's going to uh, give me a, uh, just a summary of the latitude and longitude, minimum, maximums of uh, all the parameters. Just an idea of if you're working on a particular project or a particular area, um, the history of, of each of your files. So obviously a lot of features in the software, uh, fairly straightforward to use and, and operate. Uh, can't get through everything in the short time we have, but that should give you a bit of an overview. Well, it's become a significant part of the overall product, and initially uh, it, I think it exceeded what we originally decided to do, but, but a lot of user feedback and, and it was you know, a lot of these features were, were available, so we, again, just like we try to incorporate the most modern and available technologies into the hardware, we did the same with the software. You know, we, we can do this stuff, so why not, why not do it? Absolutely. Okay, so... Putting up for an hour listening in on our talk on the castaway. We'd be happy to take any questions you have coming in online. Uh, we got a couple out here already. Um, you know, one one question that came in was about uh, calibration for the conductivity and salinity. And, and again, um, there there is no field calibration. Uh, the, the instrument comes out of the case ready to use, um, and you don't have to you know put in any solution or whatever to calibrate. You just you just use it. And then once per year, there's a factory calibration, comes back to the factory, and they check it out and apply any, any change to it, and then let you know what, um, what kind of change might happen. Um, um, you know, one thing is, another, we have another question here. Um, I have my own Bluetooth adapter. Will the Castaway work with it? Um, you know, we, we made an active decision to go ahead and include a Bluetooth that has the best drivers. Um, it seems to be the least painful. Better uh, deliverable uh, issues and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we supply one with each one of the castaway units. Uh, we have had uh, random success uh, because of the way we we actually attach the castaway. We're not actually asking you to register it. We go out and search for them. Um, it doesn't work with all Bluetooth adapters. I personally have uh, two machines that I've run the Castaway on. We were obviously lots and lots of machines over the, the last few months here. Uh, but I run Bluetooth adapt two different Bluetooth adapters, one for keyboard and mice and one for the Castaway, and they seem to interact and play with one another without any issues. Good question. Got a question come in. Uh, uh, get snagged. Um, you know, the line snags on the bottom. <laughs> The best advice you give is be, you know, be cautious of where you're where you're dropping it. You don't want to lose it, just like any other. Debris or 
debris, be it natural or man-made, on the bottom. And uh, you just got to factor that in, make sure you got a strong enough line that, uh, you know, if you, if you got to tug it back up, that it doesn't break. Um, but I, I don't have much advice to offer other than that. Um, kind of comes into the next question. Uh, we had a question about what about uh, adverse weather conditions or hostile conditions of uh, sea state or temperature. Um, yeah, you know, uh, worse to the system than our customers should ever be. So, you know, we've done some uh, pretty significant tests where we, we took it to minus 60 degrees C for 10 minutes. We put it under pressure to 100 meters. We took it back out, put it in minus 60 degrees again for another 10 minutes. The system continued to operate. We then dunked it in normal water. It operates through that whole process that I any issues. Now, if you leave it in minus 60 degrees, everything gets cold enough, batteries stop working. Minus 60 degrees, see, that's very cold if anybody's ever. <laughs> and we're, but we want to see the system get used in those hard to reach areas that, that it could reach some temperatures of minus 40 or minus 50 outside for a reasonable length of time. Sure, if you leave it out there for 30 or 45 minutes where the internals get that cold, things stop working. But as soon as you warm them back up again, they do. So we've been abusive to it. We've dropped it. We don't want you to drop it. Um, that's one of the reasons the jacket's on there. It provides a little bit of extra cushion for it. It is a scientific instrument, but we also understand the field. This is where you know Chris and I and the rest of the design team, we've been out there and we know what it means to, to be out there. And there's a lot of things on your mind, so we want to make something that's going to survive it. Great. All right. Well, that, that uh, you know, there, there, there's other questions um, that we plan on answering all of them in, in email format, and we'll circulate it amongst the folks who attended the webinar. Um, appreciate your time and coming out listening to us and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Yes, thank you.